What do you want to do tonight, Z? The same thing we do every night, Jeff. Try to decentralize the world. <laughs> Hey everybody, we're uh, Jeff and Z here from the Common Stack, and we just wanted to chat through uh, all the exciting developments we've had with our project lately and uh, walk you through some of the simulations and demo apps that we've been creating to bring you up to speed on all the exciting stuff of Common Stack. Awesome. So, um, big picture, Common Stack. You know, I have a picture of that, right? <laughs> No, I'm very visual, all right. So as I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do, I'm drawing things. There's actually like a million tabs in Lucid Chart, but we're going to talk about this one. We call it the Cyber Physical Commons because it's sort of derived from principles from cyber physical systems. But our goal is to create a sort of regenerative economy, and in order to do that, we sort of need to reason about feedback loops. So, um, Jeff, do you want to sort of try to give an overview, and I'll see if I can add some color. For sure. So we can see here that the uh, everything within the box is within the local economy created by the augmented bonding curve, and then everything outside is is the outside economy. So your typical user would engage with this by uh, mint purchasing into the augmented bonding curve, which mints tokens for the user, and those tokens come from a token supply, and the collateral that is put into the curve by the user goes into a reserve pool. Um, and then whenever the user decides to exit this economy, they pay the exit tax, uh, and that goes into the funding pool. So an important commentary here is that the bonding curve is not actually the system, it's actually the interface. So we talk about it like it's a cell wall, or it's really there to control or sort of modulate the boundary between our system that we've designed and the outside economy. which often is confusing for people because the bonding curve itself doesn't actually do anything. And this is a challenge with a lot of the, you know, sustainable designs for funding that are based on bonding curves because actually until you define the rest of the economy or the, uh, the internal economy that the bonding curve bounds, it's very hard to understand whether it actually makes sense. And so what, what Z means by that is we, we basically give these tokens more than just one form of value. In most token bonding curves you hear about, um, they're basically just worth a claim on the collateral. But within our system, they're actually worth um, governance over the funding pool as well. And that takes place through a mechanism called conviction voting. And that essentially creates multiple forms of value for the token so that you have stability against this run on the bank scenario that most bonding curves come up against where, you know, it's, if it's a Ponzi scheme, uh, you know, the, the next person to buy in, you should sell as quickly as possible. However, with the augmented bonding curve, the more tokens that are sold, the fewer tokens are in supply, means you have more power over the governance of the funding pool, which, cre which creates a buy pressure back up the curve. And as a bonus, because we actually charge a tax on exit, the, the funding pool is actually growing in response to exiting. So in a sense, it's a little bit like a continuous rage quit. If people are leaving, they're leaving maybe a little bit of their, their, con their control over the ecosystem or maybe all the way. But in the process, they're leaving behind some value that the people who stay in get to steer. And another important point about this is you don't actually have to have conviction voting implemented to get the benefit of it. Convi conviction voting is something that we designed in order to sort of improve the overall sort of flow of this economy, but it's totally reasonable to implement a standard time box voting. And in fact, that's what we will do in our earliest Im implementations. And that way we can deliver repeatedly and continue to test our components and sort of integrate the new ones as they get developed. And conviction voting, for anybody who hasn't heard of it before, is essentially a continuous decision-making process where all the proposals of a community are on the table at any given time, and community members can, can basically assert their preference behind the proposals they would like to see take place. And this works kind of like a, a neuron in a brain. So when there's a, an action potential building up and when a certain threshold is reached, the neuron fires. This is exactly like conviction voting. When enough of the aggregated community preference reaches a set threshold, the proposal fires um, and then funds are sent, work is done, die is paid out to the workers who completed that work. And actually this is a really important part of the bonding curve as well. It, that work is paid out in native tokens which is essentially governance over the system. So the more labor that is being done by people, the more governance and control and co-ownership they have in that system. So essentially we're trying to balance out 
um, the power balance between labor and capital. And since capital is a, um, a stock and labor is a flow, labor only comes hour by hour, but you can stockpile capital. So we're trying to balance out that, um, uh, that dichotomy between those two. Uh, and in particular here, people are going to need to take out their tokens as capital to pay their expenses. And the UX in, the, in this system will allow them to sort of set what they need and take it out. Um, I think one of the things that often gets lost here, though, is that the actual purpose of the system isn't the governance, it's the thing that's governed. And so there's material outputs as a result of the labor. And the real value of this system comes from what those outputs produce, and the governance is there to help provide human guidance, and in particular, the guidance of people with skin in the game, either through their labor or through their capital, to steer which proposals get funded, and ideally to participate in the actual output of the labor and the resulting um, value creation. Now, here we've said very little about what that value creation is, because this is a framework that doesn't necessarily just map to, say, open source software development, or, for example, maintaining a sort of public space. The key here is that the value is realized in the outside world and valued by the outside economy. And in a sort of more traditional nonprofit setting, you're basically saying, look, if you value the public goods produced by this system, then you should be putting funds into the funding pool and sort of letting the system turn them into public goods. And you know, one of the ways we talk about this is in terms of this sort of private capital being put into the funding pool and at that point it's a common pool resource but it's still rivalrous the idea is that through this process we're converting these rivalrous private you know, private goods and common pool resources into non-rivalrous public goods and you know open source software is a go-to example for this community but in fact any sort of maintenance of public infrastructure can be thought of as a sort of non-rivalrous public good. And what we want to support is the governance over those public goods and the contributions or even maintenance of those public goods by those who benefit from it. And this system as a whole is designed to make that possible in a relatively streamlined, transparent way, and as much as possible, a decentralized way, where we don't need a centralized institution to maintain a sort of publicly consumed public good, it's really in the interest of the people who live in and around those goods or are to, who use them in, on a day-to-day -day basis to participate both in their maintenance creation, maintenance and creation and in their governance. And essentially you can, you can consider this microeconomy as a, a cell it eats capital, it, you know, it requires some capital input, work is done, and value is, is, comes out the other side. So this is um, uh, a naturally expanding and contracting uh, economy based on the amount of value that's flowing in and flowing out of, of these communities. So this is really a, a new kind of economic mechanism that we can experiment with and see, see where it goes. And I think it's important to recognize that these things can start small. So instead of trying to have a society scale system, we're going to have like a sort of tribe scale system. And over time, the individual systems can grow, the infrastructure can improve, the tools can improve, and we can move to larger and larger sort of human systems. Um, and honestly, for me, this is important because these DAO type systems are not actually just software, right? They're software composed with humans, and it's really that combination that creates the institution or the entity. And so rather than put the software as sort of a prior, we want to actually co-evolve the software and the communities to achieve these sort of sustainable sub-economies. And you can imagine that a larger economy is actually just a big web of sub-economies that maybe share some people, maybe some capital flows between them, maybe capital flows out into the more traditional economy, but one way or another, we want to sort of emerge new sort of organism organizations and to make those organisms sustainable. And if you think this is exactly how life came about, it started as single-celled organisms, became multi-celled organisms, those organisms specialized, others turned into highly complex uh, interconnected systems, and this is really kind of the, the beginning of this form of economic life, you might say. Cool. So let's talk about what we've done so far. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we, we have these awesome systems uh, or these awesome diagrams, but what, what, what can we do with these diagrams? How do we know that you know, this is actually going to work how this, these arrows point? So we don't, but we can work on trying to understand them better. And actually in order to do that, um, I've been working with my team at Block Science for the last couple of years to build modeling frameworks that allow us to do computer-aided design. And um, having come from robotics, automation, large-scale infrastructure systems, um, dynamic resource allocation problems, I wrote simulations all the time, and it sucked. And so it sucks less now. And the reason that it sucks less now is because we built a multi-scale modeling framework for differential games. So it's very much focused on complex adaptive systems. And what you're looking at here is the readme for our tutorials. We are ramping up to open source this framework. But for today, we're going to talk about how we used it for some preliminary simulations of the system that we just talked about. And we kind of fast forwarded to the results because we don't want this to go on for an hour. Um, <laughs> if you want to see more details on this particular model, there's a great uh, walkthrough from, was it Curation Markets? Uh, yes, the Curation Markets Skitter Call. Or you can just pick Z's brain. He loves to go through these. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll put the um, link to that video in the liner notes for this one. Yeah. That way you can check it out yourself. But here you're seeing some results from an individual run of the system. You're seeing a grid at the top of the private um, opinions of participants over proposals. So it's a multi-scale agent-based model. The agents have private uh, opinions over the proposals, and the proposals actually have internal conflicts with each other, meaning we actually don't assume that they're completely independent. Some things, if people have preferences over two things that are very similar, they're still not going to vote for both of them. They're going to vote for the one they prefer, and a variety of other internal dynamics that are encoded by a uh, multi-graph uh, state space. And how are these generated? Uh, so these are generated randomly, but using a distribution that assumes that people have sort of polarized opinions. So there's not a lot of median level opinions. So this is basically set up. This is just setting up the agents of our system and saying, okay, uh, Johnny here likes um, proposal 71 and 70, but not uh, 79 through 91. Correct. And these are, these are private signals. So in the simulation, of course, we have to have them in state. But we've actually modeled that people have a bunch of private opinions that are randomly generated. They just mean that they care about different things. And we don't really know as a system what they care about. All we know is the behavior that emerges. And in fact, a lot of this information would even be hard to sort of back out because they also have an embedded social network. People's opinions influence each other. Mm -hmm. It's a relatively sophisticated model. But to be clear, we're not assuming we know all of this stuff. Actually, the point of the way CAD-CAD is set up is that we can run A-B tests and sensitivity tests and all sorts of computational scientific experiments to sort of see how sensitive the overall results are to any particular assumptions. So, so we're basically trying to model people's thought process, why they might vote for a certain thing or why. And I mean, we're not presuming that they will be this way, but we are trying to see how simulations respond to different preferences. So the important thing to understand about systems like the one we were just talking about is that they sort of have an embedded structure. They have sort of you know, differential relations. They have conservation relations. They have a variety of things that make the real system sort of lower dimensional than the space of all possible outcomes. And so what actually ends up happening is that the, the system processes the randomness or processes the noise or even processes or interacts with the behavior patterns. And then you get some results that are like channeled or colored by the system. And so what we like to do is look for the ways in which things are the same despite the randomness, despite the changes in behavior assumptions, and like despite all of the things that are out of our control. And so okay. a, a computer-aided design is actually about not like predicting what's going to happen. It's about sort of understanding what's sort of happening because of the system sort of funneling it. And we would iterate the system until the kinds of results that we want are sort of certainly more probable than the ones we don't want. But actually, in some cases, we can even design systems that uh, make certain sort of failure modes much, much harder to achieve because they push back against the, uh, the sort of movements in the direction we don't want to go. And for, for the sake of sort of moving along here, I'll just point out that we currently have a set of runs in front of you that just shows uh, sort of a general, more or less stable outcome in terms of the proposals staying balanced. And if you were to scroll through, you'd see the funds that are being added are being diminished at roughly the rate that they're coming in. And um, the proposals themselves are asking 
for on the order of about 10% to 1% of the funding pool. And as a result, some, some proposals are passing. A lot of what you're seeing here is my scratch work. And actually, <laughs> um, you should look forward to future cleaned up versions of these simulations, thanks to one of the team members, Ravi, who's actually been going through this and, and looking to make it into something a bit more presentable. Um, I, I think we should probably move along. Yeah. Um, is this is this the graph of the proposals passing once they hit the threshold plus seven days? Yes. So in fact, because this this current simulation has the full system, including conviction voting, proposals pass by sort of charging up. And actually, there's a little video of that somewhere that I made using this simulation. And basically, what it tells you is that if there's widespread support, then the conviction voting allows the sort of proposal to charge up. If there's things that are not getting enough support, then they sort of never pass the threshold. Um, but there's also things that are not actually moving up at all because they, they're asking for such a large percentage of the funding pool that the support they have is actually just not enough to register. Um, we have a sort of lower threshold where the sort of cost of passing something is infeasible. And so we won't try to go into it now, but the point is that the thresholds are actually dynamic. And if you're requesting too much of the funding pool, then you're not going to get, um, get a chance to pass. So you would either need to bring more funds into the capital pool or sort of maybe make a proposal for it's asking for a smaller percentage of the overall funds. Cool. That's really neat. And we can see here these along the left are all the participants in the system. The lines are them expressing preference towards the preferences on the right, uh, towards the proposals on the right, sorry. The darker the line, the more uh, weight your preference has. Is that correct? The more, yeah, the more you're supporting. And the, the left side is the agents, and they have a certain number of holdings. I think, I mean, the main thing here is that this is sort of a, a working draft, sort of a engine, internal engineer scratch work. But the point is we actually have running simulations. We're messing with the assumptions. We're seeing what happens. And we've done at least enough to prove that our, our ideas make sense, that the kind of dynamic feedback loops that we designed for exist. But there's a lot to be tuned, a lot to be sort of you know tested against implementations. Part of the working process for computer aided design is not to assume that the abstractions are perfect, but actually to also test the implementations against the models. And we're moving towards building implementations of various stages of this system, starting with the augmented bonding curve. So I think we should sort of move on to what's next, which is mm -hmm. very much the implementations of the augmented bonding curves. And in particular, we want to go over sort of what the augmented bonding curve is. Uh, this is from an article that we wrote with Abby mm -hmm. and uh, mapped out the augmented bonding curves logic using a sort of conservation diagramming syntax that we put together along with the CAD-CAD modeling to help sort of capture the conservative flows mm -hmm. and map out these systems somewhat formally. So maybe I'll just mention what the conserved flows are. So when we are looking at the augmented bonding curve, we start with mathematical uh, formalization. So there is some uh, conservation between the reserve or the collateral and the supply that is never broken. So this, when, when we start with mathematical principles like this, we are basically defining F equals MA or V equals IR, and we are defining these conservation. Those are natural laws from physics. Right, right. <laughs> As an example. Yep. Um, so we are creating economic worlds and to have robust higher level mathematics and complexity in those worlds it needs to come down to a conservation equation so that uh when so let's talk about why conservation equations are a good way to think about this so the physical world is decentralized right you do something over here something happens energy is conserved you do something over there something happens energy is conserved nobody's actually worried about the global energy conservation principle mm. across that decentralized world because if every interaction preserves the conservation principle, then the whole system does. And you don't actually have to know anything other than just the fact that that energy conservation law was conserved. So they're decentralized. Yeah. Well, I mean, even no double spends is essentially conservation law, right? right? So once you start to build your thinking around conservation laws, it's actually natural to represent a bonding curve as a conservation law. And so what we do is we start with defining its conservation principle between supply and reserve. And so if we think of the reserve as the independent variable and the supply as the dependent variable, then what we're actually doing is providing a sort of diminishing returns function, so a concave function from reserve to supply. And that creates the sort of tight spring that means that when you try to push on the system, it, it doesn't really like give easily. And, mm -hmm. and the result is some, um, some 
some specific dynamics and then we kind of work from there. So what awesome. we're lo looking at here is just, hey, you know, we've got a live system, you're, you're bonding to mint or you're burning to withdraw. And as you can see, we have our exit tax, which basically says, if you want to leave the system, you're going to leave some of it behind for the sort of future of this community. So you shouldn't enter this community if you're not prepared to sort of at least leave something behind when you go. So in this, this property does a few nice things for us. One of, it is, one of them is that it sort of disincentivizes uh, short term um, sort of just trading in and out because you, if you don't stay long enough to realize a return that's greater than the fee, then you're just sort of like screwing yourself. <laughs> the other thing is that if you're going to try to front run someone else's transactions, you would only want to do this if you could extract more than the fee. And so we try to turn the fee up enough that it's greater than the slippages. And actually we did some rather involved analysis about what slippages occur as a function of the supply and the reserve. So I actually have a pretty good feeling that, um, you know, as long as the system is sufficiently capitalized when it's launched, the actual fees for um, leaving will be high enough to, uh, and enough higher than the slippages that there really won't be a lot of incentive to um, uh, front run these transactions. So this is a pretty good multi-purpose mechanism that addresses several of the attack vectors of, of bonding curves. I mean, and, and most importantly, though, it addresses the fact that the bonding curve is not the capital that you spend. You can see the funding pool over here. We have a separate pool of funds, and while it will sort of charge up from activity on the bonding curve, it's not actually the bonding curve's reserve pool, because the reserve pool for the bonding curve is essentially the collateralization of the tokens, which is distinct from the funds that are governed by the tokens themselves, even though they're both denominated in DAI here. Um, going back to our discussion of the whole system, remember that if this system is not governed in such a way that it produces real value, no one's going to put any money in it. And that's okay. In fact, you would argue that's by design because you don't want these systems to be magic money creating machines because that's not a thing. <laughs> and so if you don't actually design for a real value proposition, you can't actually expect it to attract the community and to live a sort of long and growing life. Mm -hmm. So ultimately it depends on the work that's being done by the community. The decisions about what work to do, the mm -hmm. quality of the work that's done. Mm -hmm. The idea here is that we're sort of building a machine for coordinating capital, labor, and decision-making to effectively build and maintain public goods. But at the end of the day, that sort of organic machine still has to achieve that goal. Otherwise, you're going to expect it to shrivel up and die. So we're not trying to make magic money-making machines. We're trying to make machines that sort of incentivize and support the production and maintenance of, of public goods. Mm -hmm. Conding burbs. So actually, one thing we forgot to mention is this, this is a token circuit diagram. So this, the, every um, interaction you see in this diagram is actually wired up in CAD-CAD. So this is uh, essentially an emerging standard of designing token networks. And you'll see a lot of Michael Zagram's works. I don't know why I keep calling him Michael tonight. This is bizarre. Um, but this is uh, essentially a new standard of token circuit design that we can then plug into CAD-CAD and simulate and see how it goes. And to be clear, so this, this uh, syntax is not completely new. So I, I borrowed the sort of system dynamics syntax, which is sort of high level design for business processes with, with sort of differential or flow equations in it. But we, we sort of built it up to include um, these sort of diamonds that are reminiscent of decisions in sort of, uh, I guess, flowcharts and whatnot, because there's an active component, unlike the sort of passive system dynamics models where things just sort of flow because they're on, here flows occur because of events, because of actions on the part of participants. And so we are a little bit more explicit about the fact that the system only flows as a result in event of an event that sort of mutates the state of the state machine and actually transitions the system. And our laws or natural laws are just about what's conserved or not when those state transitions occur. Awesome. What do we have next? I think we're going to talk about the bonding curve design specifically using our web app. Perfect. So this is one of the latest um, tools out of the common stack 
which is a pretty exciting simulation. Um, and essentially it has all these initialized parameters, which some of which we just went through in the lucid chart diagram. So you can determine, actually, I guess we didn't talk about funds going into the funding pool. No, so we actually were looking at what the live system looks like, and this is about kicking it off. So one of the most important things about systems is that initial conditions matter a lot. And so while we might design a, an awesome bonding curve, if we don't actually initialize it at a reasonable place, it still might act weird. So this web app is sort of meant to take us out of the realm of CAD-CAD into the realm of sort of easy you know, UX toys. So CAD CAD's great for data scientists, for systems engineers, and people who are you know, comfortable building models in Python and sort of fusing them with data and running experiments. But that's really not what we want everyone to have to experience. So we, we made this augmented bonding curve app that allows you to sort of set up some relatively straightforward you know, variables to define the bonding curve itself. I will note that this top part here is actually setting up that natural law. So when we pick the numbers about how much of a, what percentage of the funds will go directly into the funding pool versus which percentage of the funds will go into the collateral for the bonding curve, when we decide what the price is gonna be for the initialization sale relative to the price at the point of initialization, this can be a little tricky. So the idea is that the bonding curve itself has this diminishing returns curve, but for the people who participate in the actual launch or hatch sale, we give them a linear price. And so everyone gets the same price. So all hatchers or all initializers of the bonding curve are going to share the same price. They're not going to experience the curve directly. And we, we choose a price for them. And the result of choosing a price for them is going to influence the effects of choosing the sort of launch price. And it's a little tricky that these numbers are different, but it comes from the fact that mathematically we're transitioning from something that's represented by a line to something that's represented by a curve. And when we pick this post hatch number, we're actually deciding the shape of the curve. So you can see when, when Jeff plays around with it, he dramatically changes the curvature. You can see that it can go from a relatively light curvature to a very high curvature. And we have to think about this curvature about in terms of the diminishing returns. And if we go back to our spring analogy, if we turn it up too far and it's very sharp, then the spring is very tight and it's very hard to move the system. If we turn it down too far, then the spring is very loose and maybe it wiggles around a lot. And so we want something in the middle and we have been looking at this sort of 0.3, um, you know, so the, the sort of 0.3 die against the 0.1 die as a sort of balanced middle middle level. Obviously, you know, we have to sort of proceed to better understand whether this is a good choice, but uh, it's where we're starting off because it's a little bit like modest, it's in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so we can also set the exit tribute, which is the amount that um, when you leave the economy, you pay that portion from your um, what you are withdrawing into the funding pool. And we can also set the vesting half-life period. So we haven't mentioned this yet, but essentially we're saying to the community that's hatching these curves, you can purchase these tokens or you are issued these tokens at 0.1 die per token. And when the curve launches into its open phase, they're worth 0.3 die. So that's a, a 3x return right there. And obviously if everyone could just sell, then that would tank the economy, which is one of these concerns around bonding curves. So this is the vesting half-life mechanism. It essentially says um, anybody who is participating in the hatch receives their tokens at a drip. They have their tokens for governance. They can use them in conviction voting or time box voting uh, immediately, but they're not able to burn them back to the curve and reclaim they're just restricted from the They're just restricted from the burn mechanism. Exactly. So you yes. have them, they're yours, but they cannot be burned. Right. And the reason they cannot be burned is because we want to align long-term incentives. So in fact, not only is the half-life set, there's a cliff. And so at the very beginning, there's actually a floor price because a large number of the tokens simply cannot be burned. And that means that the price cannot fall below the point on the bonding curve that is associated with the, those, those tokens existing. Mm -hmm. And we'll actually show you a simulation because in this particular toy um, or model or 
simulation, we've basically shown the difference between the system's rules, which is the bonding curve's natural law, and you know one realization or sequence of events. And mm -hmm. lots of things can happen. The token value can go up and down. And generally speaking, it's dependent on the behavior of the participants, the real value they create. And so we want to sort of show that noise, that volatility, that potential. And so Jeff's going to run this a couple times and just kind of give you a sense of how different it can be. Um, in our in our current runs, we'll see generally big spikes on launch. It's driven by sort of enthusiasm and marketing, and we see this over and over again. But in some cases, this is actually going to drop well below the initialization line. So another way you can think about the 0.1 to 0.3 spread is this is a hedge for the risk incurred by the, the hatchers, by those who launch this community, because there really isn't anything to say that this community is going to stabilize or balance out above that line. And it's very possible that once it finds its sort of, you know, right size, that it's going to be smaller than, than the, the post hash price. And what we really wanted to do was make sure that that wasn't a reason for that cell or that community or that organization to fail. And so if the right balance point here ends up being 0.2, then actually the people who helped launch, launch that community still ended up better off. Mm -hmm. And so the vesting period helps make sure that they don't have an incentive to just run the system out, but it also makes sure that, that if the system stabilizes below the launch price on the bonding curve, that it's not resulting in something that the original sort of hatchers or DAO launchers um, would be upset about. And so they incur some risk by actually doing this because we don't know where it's going to land and they have to wait. Mm -hmm. And again, this is um, also a speculative economy. So there could be all sorts of um, speculative trading on this. And of course, you know, we have this almost speculation tax that exit uh, tribute when people leave the economy. So. so on this diagram, you can see that blue accumulating. And so what you see, the, the y-axis starts at... Um, you know, what's that? One million five hundred because we had a fifth, we had a five million raise and a thirty percent of the hatch go to the funding pool. The, of the hatch raise go to the funding pool, but then there's another um, one point two million raised as a result of the exit taxes over the course of that run. And this is something that's very important because what we want, as we discussed before, is for a sort of leaving to leave something behind to make sure that the system is always got a pressure back to um, basically say, well, if you leave some behind for the people who are staying to govern the funds, then there should always be sort of value left to steer. And we wouldn't necessarily expect the system to all the way run out because in theory, there's always someone who's going to want to wait and govern the funds that are left from the others who are exiting the system. Mm -hmm. And just so everybody knows, this green line is the price of the token. That's the token issued by the bonding curve. The blue line is the amount of funds that are provided to the community between the uh, amount that is initialized in the hatch and the amount that is continuously generated through the exit tribute. And this yellow line is the floor price. So this is essentially if everyone sold all their tokens as soon as they became available on the vesting curve. So basically the price of the token cannot drop below this line. And that means that it's strictly supported by the tokens that have not vested. It's still a worst case bound. So we literally derived the worst case scenario, which is open loop. It doesn't depend on the actual sort of random bin and feedback behavior of the users. It depends only on the, the curve itself. And so what you'll see is that over time, that's actually dynamically approaching zero. But that still only means that if everyone sold every token, the price would drop to that point. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, we raised two million die on the dot. That's pretty cool. Oh, you can also see in the simulation the um, uh, slippages. And actually, this is mm -hmm. really important because the slippages are very small. And this was kind of something that we spent a lot of time playing with the parameters around because we want people to experience, you know, sub 1%, ideally sort of sub, um, sub a tenth of a percent slippages because the point here is not to put any real burden on this sort of day-to-day -day transactions or people coming in with small amounts of funds relative to the total pool. Of course, the larger you take as a transaction, the further the curve is going to move and the more slippage you incur, but the, the system is modeled in such a way that the sort of transactions are um, sort of relatively, uh, relatively small in the sense of um, 
you know, thousands instead of, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands. Um, obviously, if you get large relative to the total liquidity, you're going to see larger slippages. But actually, if you keep track of this, most, you know, even 10 order tens of thousands of diet transactions are on the order of, of you know, 1% or less of the whole liquidity. And the result is then that you experience slippages about on the same order as your um, transaction relative to the liquidity. And so this actually essentially makes front running the bonding curve non-profitable yeah so you'd actually have to be um you would have to be making such a large transaction that the slippage that you would incur would have to be larger than the exit fee and that's if we're setting this in the two to five percent that means that you would have to be making transactions that were extremely large and in fact we're not really trying to encourage big large you know these large transactions at one point in time we're trying to encourage a sort of more organic participation and so rather than having this be sort of whale oriented, it's sort of community or participant oriented. And as a result, we generally don't expect this to be driven by um, sort of massive transactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Oh, great. What else do we have on our list to? Um, well, I think you were going to talk a bit about the raise, um, about the raise. since we yeah. finished showing off our, our most recent toys. Right. So yeah, other than these exciting toys, we have some other announcements coming out from the common stack. So actually at the token engineering global gathering, we will be announcing our, um, our public application period. So you can apply to become a member of the common stack and support and contribute to our collective vision to build these tools. So, so yeah. I mean, I'm going to ask you like, so why should I be a member of the common stack? Well, essentially the common stack is looking to build a trusted seed of token engineer and decentralized governance experts. And these are the people that will be able to uh, hatch and participate in all of these augmented bonding curve experiments. So we've realized that the health of the system is dependent on the health of the seed. And we need to make sure that this trusted seed of initial actors are going to be um, using good judgment in these systems. They're not coming in to be extractive. They're not coming in to uh, basically take down the experiment because in the early stages of these systems, they're very, they're very open to exploit. So, I mean, one way to think about this is that once we acknowledge that a DAO is the composition of the human actors and the code or the system, then actually launching one isn't just about making the code, it's about seeding the system with good actors. And we learned that this is something a little bit tricky because you, you know, there's a lot of, sort of you know, regulatory questions and legal questions about DAOs, it's an emerging area. And so, you know, with great effort, we sort of defined a very modest and bounded sort of centralized Swiss association. And that association's job is essentially to help curate humans. And we're doing application processes, we're talking to people, we're interviewing people, we're doing KYC processes, and basically creating a streamlined pool of people to participate in these experiments and that as you know takes time and money and effort and we've been doing a lot of work up front but alongside our design work and tool development but ultimately we think it's going to make a huge difference in when it comes to these um, experiments because we're acknowledging the human and technical component of the system and sort of exploring what it takes to have a healthy DAO. Mm -hmm. So we've actually broken out our code base into five iterations so we want to be able to ship often and early um, and raise appropriate amounts of money for each of those components. So we've broken out each component into its own uh, build phase. So we're starting with the augmented bonding curve, then we'll be working on the giveth DAP, then we'll be working on conviction voting, and then we're gonna pull it all together with the Commons Analytics dashboard, which is kind of a measuring the impact of the system. And then we're gonna synthesize everything into what we're calling a minimum viable commons. And this is kind of the smallest system that is composed of all these components that can work. That was the diagram that we walked through earlier. But to be clear, so the minimum viable commons is obviously not the first commons. We're gonna be launching one with the augmented bonding curve, the augmented bonding curve um, used as the interface to the outside economy and I will point out that one of the reasons we think this is so important is because the existing framework for DAOs as sort of funding clubs is that the earliest participants have sort of put in capital they have influence they allocate capital the next round of participants adds capital and helps participate but the sort of ratio of influence to capital that you help to get steer 
gets sort of worse and worse step over step. And these groups are sort of working to contend with this challenge and we're making a point to sort of address it up front. And so our designs with the augmented bonding curve are to basically sort of deal with this challenge sort of up front and hopefully we'll find out from our first DAO experiment that it's a big that you know it's a big step towards sustainable funding and sustainable influence relative to contribution. And if we don't, then by the next iteration, we'll be sort of further improving our designs, using our models, using our tools. And the, the exciting thing about these components as well is they will be easily forkable and usable by any other community. So if Malik Dao or Meta Cartel are interested, if they look at the token uh, engineering commons and say, wow, there's a sustainable funding mechanism we can use, that's a component that can be used by anybody in the space. And same thing with uh, all of the common stack components. Yeah, not, nothing about what we're building is intended to be rivalrous. Like the entire goal is commons oriented. Like, yes, we're asking for funding and funding is sort of rivalrous private capital, but our 100% goal is to turn it into non-rivalrous public goods. And insofar as that creates value for those communities and any other community, we hope that people will help support our effort. Mm -hmm. So we are starting out with funding iteration one, which is the augmented bonding curve, and we're looking to raise 986,000 DAI, and then we have budgets for each iteration beyond that, so that the total project will cost between seven and nine million DAI. Um, and you've seen some of the rigor of the research and development and tooling and uh, simulating and modeling that goes into these components. So it's it's definitely no small feat in complex system design. And the first deliverable is actually to open source CAD CAD. I'm like really excited to do that, though we're going to need to sort of scale up support for it. Right now we're running it in private beta. My academic collaborators are using it. Some of the team members from the common stack are using it. And um, we've gotten lots of positive feedback. We've continued to sort of re refine the, the documentation and we're running a GiveF hosted server for people who want to try it out. Um, I'm very excited though to, to get, go from sort of supporting you know, small groups of people to sort of scaling into supporting a larger community. Um, yeah. Yeah, and CAD CAD, uh, for those of you who don't know, is, is an emerging standard in complex adaptive system design. Um, if you think of, you know, mechanical engineers use AutoCAD, uh, electrical engineers use use Spice or you know MATLAB or any of these simulation tools. This is going to be an, an industry standard in complex adaptive system design and in crypto networks. That's that's huge. This is industry changing. It's modeled after a lot of the, de the decision systems design tools that are available in MATLAB for sort of physical systems, but with a focus on much more social systems. And one of the main reasons it was built in Python is because it integrates nicely with all of the sort of social science and data science equipment that's actually already in that ecosystem, plus MATLAB is paywalled and uh, we obviously don't want CAD CAD to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, is there anything else that we didn't? I would say the only other thing I would love to chat about a bit is you recently published an article on computer-aided governance, I was which is the same thing. Um, I mean, you should tell us a bit about it. I think it's important to understand why we have analytics in our minimum viable commons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that fourth component was the commons analytics dashboard, which basically feeds back. You know, how is this system performing? You know, what the proposals that were done are they? You know, were they done properly? Were they are they contributing to the health of the community? You know, you can have that feedback loop to in, informing the humans who are essentially in charge of, of governance of this system, whether or not, you know, the, the work that is being done or has been done is, is providing value for the community. And they are essentially the ones that are steering the policies of this community through conviction voting. So you can essentially create this feedback loop where uh, people now have all the information that is going on in this economy because blockchains really open up rich temporal data streams for us. It's kind of like the big data of the economy, which in, in economics today, I mean, most economists will laugh at you if you say, you know, you can try to model anything or simulate anything about the economy uh, because it's just so complex. There's cash, there's black markets, there's all sorts of rule bending. But once we're in this, the economic sandbox of, of a blockchain, you really have a set of specific actions that people can follow and therefore you can do, you know, put all sorts of machine learning and, and AI algorithms um, basically combing through that data and running simulations on whether, you know, if this proposal is passed, what might that outcome look like, you know? So we have certain situations in, in uh, governance in the real world where we are trying to solve a problem, but 
the policies that we're implementing actually only makes it worse. Well, and to be clear, no one is proposing that you can particularly perfectly mm -hmm. predict what's going to happen because there's a lot of elements here that aren't directly observable related to people's behavior. And while we have behavioral models from the behavioral economics literature that can help us understand and even model the human dynamics, one of the important parts about the computer-aided governance framework is that it is not saying what's going to happen. It is essentially showing you sort of potential consequences under a variety of assumptions. But what's important about that is that people can come to their own conclusions. So if you have a common analytics dashboard or you have tooling that's designed to facilitate understanding, people can make their own assumptions, kind of like we did when we messed around with our bonding curve designs, and then set their assumptions, see what happened, and make their own decisions about what to support using the same tools. And one of the ways that we are going about this is to sort of make sure that we can let people expose their own signal. So instead of telling people what to think, we want tools that help people discover their own opinions and express them. We want, people provide the signals in these systems. They're not something to be predicted so much as they're something to be sort of their, their knowledge is to be collected and fused into the overall behavior. Very cool. So we want the humans to stay in charge of these systems. Even if there's no particular human that's in charge, right? So closing the loop on governance is about not just allowing people to make decisions, but allowing them to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So this is almost like Iron Man's Jarvis, you're saying. Jarvis point oh 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 one. Yeah, maybe, but I think it's important to remember that there isn't like, you know, one God's eye, right? That even in the Commons Analytics dashboard, we want people to be able to sort of, you know, instance their own analytics. I mean, the blockchain data is, you know, available directly. You know, I had some great chats with um, Baron about what it might look like to actually run a dashboard on, on Avado hardware. Like just brainstorming what could happen. But I mean, now we're talking like, you know, iteration five, big future. We want to get there, but we're not going to jump there. We're going to start with what we can do now. We're going to get our base tools out to everyone, hopefully invite more people to participate in this process. And we're going to start delivering commons one iteration at a time. Just like engineers would do. Shockingly, it's like we're engineers or something. <laughs> awesome. So I think this has been a pretty good conversation about the common stack. We hope you've enjoyed it as well. And uh, if you are interested in applying to become a member of the common stack, just head over to commonstack.org slash apply, and you can fill out the form there and we will be um, contacting you. So this is essentially funding the not-for-profit common stack association in building open source public goods that are going to be extremely useful for everyone in this industry moving forward. And if they're not useful, we'll iterate them so that the next ones are. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye.